يقول سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد نقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم هن لباس لكم وأنتم لباس لهن I have about 15 minutes to uh, address all of you and uh, this is a very critical subject and there's so much that can be said about it and I'm really glad that uh, Altaf Bhai's presentation actually was very comprehensive and it touched upon a lot of things that really uh, need to be given a lot of discussion. Each, actually, each one of his points is chapters in the book of marriage. And uh, really, it should be taken very, very seriously. All of those things can be mentioned very easily in a sentence or two, but when it comes to implementing them in our family lives, it's actually a very heavy discussion. And the few minutes I have with you, I have to be selective in what I think is pertinent and you know, what I think, inshallah ta'ala, is an amana to share with all of you. I see these conference presentations not just as opportunities for uh, rhetoric and takbirs at the end, but also as opportunities to share food for thought. Uh, and I want to pretend for a few moments that I'm just talking to a family that I know, just one of you, just a family that I know, and there's a marriage that's about to happen in your family. You're about to get your daughter married or you're about to get your son married. Uh, and I just want to share some very relevant, I think relevant advice in regards to this matter. You know, marriage is all about trust from the very beginning. And it's one thing that unfortunately I'm noticing more and more in the premarital process is missing. The foundation of two families coming together, if it's not trust and transparency and openness, there's going to be clearly problems after marriage. You know, marriage has almost become like a very difficult sale. You know, you go to a car dealership and the, the car salesman presents his best self and the best features of the car, right? And he gets really offended if you ask difficult questions. Right? And if you, if you start asking about the transmission problems that have been reported previously or the recalls or anything else, he'll just, you know, I don't know if I want to deal with this. You see what I'm saying? What's happened to us in the marriage discourse is that we actually market ourselves. The, the boy and the girl and even the families, they market themselves. So they turn the house into something it's not when they are coming over, when the in-laws are coming over. They turn themselves and their conversations into something that aren't genu genuine. That's not really a representation of who they are. How many families I can't even count, and he's, he and she are in the counseling profession, they can tell you. How many families would come and say, we, did, we had no idea they were like this. We had no clue who we were dealing with. They were completely different people before. You know, and this, this kind of scamming, which you would think would happen in the sales industry, is actually happening in the institution of marriage. And that's a crisis, as a matter of fact. We offer, you know, in some of the more, I guess, forward-thinking families that aren't as conservative, quote-unquote, they say, okay, no, let the boy and girl talk to each other. Let them email one another, let them have a few conversations. But at this point, both of them are so, like, blind, and they're so interested in just getting the, 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 the celebration and the, you know, the, the new dress and the, you know, the gifts and the, you know, all this stuff. They're so caught up in the hype and all the congratulations they're getting and all the phone calls and text messages that even when they talk to each other, it's actually empty fluff conversations. And they see the, what they want to see in the spouse. They don't, they're not able to have an intellectually sound conversation. A lot of times, the young men and the young women, because, you know, حُبُّ ain la tara, You know, or عَيْنُ الْحُبَّ asif la tara. The love, the eye of love can't see. You know, well, you're already infatuated with the idea, so it's a, you have a hard time seeing any flaws. And that infection actually lasts a little bit longer even after marriage, for the first couple of weeks. <laughs> you can't see any flaw in your spouse. Even the way she sneezes you, like, it's amazing. SubhanAllah. The way the boogers just spread out, it's, you know, Allah really made us for each other. <laughs> you know? But then it starts wearing off and reality starts setting in. How come you never told me this or that or the other? I didn't realize you're this way or that way or the other way, you know? So first, my encouragement to the families and to the young people that are looking to get married is to first to, to be mature in this process. The, there's a place for love and emotions and infatuation and I tell you, you have to put the brakes on that until the marriage is really, really close and everything else is settled. There's some other really serious things that need to be settled first, you know. Then the other thing I want to talk to is the elders, specifically the elders in our communities. You people are so worried sometimes about your messed up kids that you say maybe if we marry him to a good girl or we marry her to a good boy, things will work out fine. So all the really messed up things you know about your child, 
you don't tell anyone. You don't tell even the family that you're dealing with and you keep it hidden as best you can because if they found out, they wouldn't marry your child. And on top of that, of course, you're suffering from some kind of schizophrenia in which you tell yourself the lie so much that we have a good boy that you start believing it yourself. And in the face of reality, I mean, your child is coming home. You're, that's not a child, it's a man. Your, your son is coming home at 2, 3 in the morning. He can't even stand up straight. Oh, he must have been making tahajjud. The, you know, the tafsir seminar must have been late or... Come on. A lot of times our parents know that the, man has, the young man has a drug problem. He's got an alcohol problem. He's got a clubbing problem. I, I'm not even qualified for this sort of thing. I get emails, brother, we were talking, the conversations were going well between our families. He's actually from, you know, back home from the same neighborhood. Our families know each other. By the way, that doesn't mean anything anymore because those families are not the same when they fly over. Okay? So if you knew them back in the 70s or something, then that's not a formula to, to gauge that, oh, we know their family. No, you don't. They don't even know their own family, bro. He doesn't even know his own cousins, his uncle, his aunt. It's, it's, it's not the same family. That's a very shallow gauge. Anyhow, they say, you know, we got, he, was, he used to go to the masjid. We saw him making i'tikaf. He was praying. He even has a little bit of a beard. Alhamdulillah, it's a good boy. And then, you know, my parents got me married to him. And I thought he was, it was okay. The first time we went out to eat, true story, first time we went out to eat, he ordered a beer. And I'm sitting there going, what's going on? What, what are you doing? He goes, what's, what's the big deal? You know? Why, why are you flipping out? Calm down. And this is the, re this is the reality of like, the lack of foundation in, in many marriages. And so we shouldn't complain about the divorce rate because they're sometimes really justifi justifiable. There's some really serious situations out there that we have to deal with. And I'm not advocating for divorce. But I am saying, look, there's a reason these kinds of things are happening. And there's some really fundamental realities that we're choosing to close our eyes to that we can't afford to anymore for the sake of our own sons and our own daughters, you know. Then there's the second matter that I want to talk to you about. This is just one dimension of the many dimensions that can be spoken about post-marriage, after marriage. And this starts, this problem starts before and it permeates after. We're living in a society in which the standards of haya, the standards of shame, holding yourself back, regard, you know, some kind of reservation between yourself and the opposite gender. Those standards are dropping. I'm not complaining about the kuffar. I'm talking about the Muslim community. In our homes, okay, in our homes, by the way, license plate number GQ, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> in our homes and in, in, in our lifestyles now, our social interactions have become very permissive even within the semi-religious, semi-conservative circles. We've got a couple of extremes. On the one hand, we have these, some families in our, in our community, and we've got, we get all colors of the spectrum in America, right? So we get some families that are so incredibly conservative that women are actually evil. So if you see them anywhere near the masjid, astaghfirullah al-azim, and you know, you, you know, you might get into a car accident in the parking lot because you're trying to get away from shaitan, I mean the sister, you know? There, there's that extreme, you know? And then there's the other extreme where it's all good in the hood and you're socializing like it's your own brother. It's not your brother. You know, it's the husband of your friend. It's, it's not someone you should just be chit-chatting with unnecessarily, you know? So there is actually a line in the middle that needs to be respected. And if we don't respect it, you know what happens? When, the, when, when we have a lot of interaction, of course, social gatherings, things like iftars and dinners and, you know, things like that. And we, we get together with other families and young couples get together and there's a potluck and things like that in these kinds of gatherings. I want you to understand the, the, one of the fundamental, central, pivotal surahs in the Quran about marriage is Surah An-Nur. Right? It's one of the pivotal ayat, surahs about marriage. And in this surah, it seems at first glance, it deals with too many varied topics like it starts with people who violate the sanctity of marriage, the zani. It starts with them, the fornicator, the adulterer, right? It talks in the, you know, it talks also deals with the scandal that was started about the marriage of the Prophet Also a subject matter, you know, the accusation made against Aisha radiallahu anha. Also a matter dealing with marriage. It also deals with some rules that should be observed inside the house. For instance, for instance, those of you who believe 
لا تدخلوا بيوتا غير بيوتكم حتى تستأذنوا تستأنسوا Don't enter your homes that aren't yours until you make yourself known. In other words, let them prepare. Let the, you know, the women cover themselves or, you know, uh, take caution that a ghayr mahram man is coming in. There needs to be some adjustments made when a stranger is about to go, come into the home. So watch out. You know, I mean, th those kinds, you know, they say in Arabic, I repeat this a lot of times. In Urdu we say, akal man ke ishara kafi hai. Right? When Allah is saying, make yourself known before you come into somebody's house, it's to allow the family to adjust themselves. But you know what? It's, there's no adjustment anymore. It's all good. You know? And the, the very next ayat are about lowering your gaze. That's incredible. Lowering your gaze where? In, in, in the original context of the surah, where? In the house. Yes, you should lower your gaze when you're walking in the mall. You should lower your glance because you're going to see inappropriate things. Especially husbands, watch out, lower your eyes. Especially husbands. Shaitan will want you to be uninterested in your wife. That's what he wants you to be. And he wants you to you know, compare her to whatever you see on the street. Or whatever you see anywhere else. You know, lower your eyes. But you know what? More important than all of those virtual kinds of pleasures that people are pursuing, more important than all of that, the people you're interacting with on a regular basis, you're going to see them over and over and over again, particularly in those cases, lower your eyes. You know? It's really disturbing. I've even heard husbands talk about how well somebody else's wife was dressed. I mean, that's disgusting for a Muslim community. It's, it's, it's violating the sanctity of marriage even in certain what we, we would consider not criminal behaviors. Or well, it's not haram to sit and have dinner together, is it? It's not, I'm not saying it is, but I am saying it does have psychological consequences. It does have social consequences. And what's really one of the most remarkable things to me personally in this surah, Surah An-Nur, specifically Surah An-Nur, is right after this conversation about certain rules around the house, even certain rules about when, whether your children can come into the bedroom or not, and when they can and when they can't, and the fact that they should ask permission. How many of you and, and myself even have set the rules like that in the house? But when you come into my room, knock first. Ask if you can come in. Don't just knock and walk in. That's the other thing, right? Just, I knocked. <laughs> you know? Knock and ask permission and then walk in. You know? And there are certain hours even Allah set in the ayat. There are certain ayat where they should do that, and certain ayat, it's fine, it's open policy, open door policy. I know my time's up. I gotta... Okay, one minute, cool. I thought I was up. So, those rules have been set in place, and then in this same surah, Allah Azza wa talks about the ayat of Nur, the light in the heart. The light in the heart. This is the same surah that talks about khimar, the covering of the woman. But everything else seems to be related to marriage and guarding haya and all of a sudden there's a conversation about the deepest elements of spirituality, probably the most profound passage in the Quran on spirituality in this same surah. Why? Because we're being taught. Look, observing these things will help your spirituality and violating these things will hurt your spirituality. The light in your heart will be, will be hurt, will be damaged if you don't address these things. They have direct consequences. These are the few things, I mean, again, 15 minutes is very little time. I don't, I don't even think I should give longer speeches than 15 minutes because I'm in the teaching profession and I have respect for something called attention span, which Muslims, alhamdulillah, face extra special problems with. But, uh, you know, because we, we, we're used, uh, used to on a weekly basis. We attend a convention every week. It's called Jum'ah prayer. And alhamdulillah, we get some of the best sleep of our life in those 20 minutes, you know. First thing we hear is Alhamdulillah, next thing we hear is Aqim is Salat. You know? <laughs> you know? So I'm, I, I'm mindful of that, but hopefully some of these things are conversations you can have with your family. And really reflect upon how you and I are conducting ourselves, uh, you know, uh, in our households. I worry about my daughters and how I'm going to get them married and my boys. I really do. Not just in how I'm going to raise them, which is a big problem. But the other problem is, where am I going to get, find the families that see life the same way? Beyond just the, the appearances, where am I going to find those, those real men of the future? And those real women of the future? May Allah Azza wa help us grow those real men and those real women. And may Allah Azza wa protect the sanctity of marriage in our homes. And give us the ability to have a clear, transparent, just, and merciful process, even for, the getting, for our, getting our children married.